Am I on? Can you? Oh, there, now, there I am. Let's try this again now that you can hear me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know, my, my wife and most of my kids, Josh stayed home with me because Josh is taking some hard classes. Uh, he didn't feel like he could go away, but my nephew got married in Florida. So I do not sleep well when my wife is not next to me. I don't know why that is, uh, just, uh, but you, if I seem a little sluggish, a little slow, it's because uh, my wife is gone and she, uh, she just makes me feel normal, I guess. I feel a little abnormal this morning. There's a few guys in here that know what I mean, and they've been in that situation. So um, when I pray this morning, well, pray for, pray for me. Uh, I need it. The other thing is, is I know that there are some things, some stress, some life that's happening around us. I appreciate Heather uh, praying this morning for um, the tension that's in the air. I met with a group of pastors this week, and we, we all just feel the tension in the air. And so we need to pray because God gives us a peace that transcends understanding, and we need to trust in him and acknowledge him and, um, and reflect his nature and his character. Uh, that's really necessary right now for our community is the nature and character of Christ to be seen. So the other thing is, is uh, there's just friends and family and, and you who have uh, just health issues, stress issues, financial stress issues, relational stress issues, and we come to church to be still and know that he is God and we have these things heavy on our heart. And so um, we just want to lay all these things and lay you at the feet of Jesus who loves you and cares for you. You have a father that loves you and cares for you. And so there's people, uh, I, Walt, are you still scheduled for uh, a procedure at 5.30 tomorrow morning? I will be praying for you at 5.30. We're going to take some time here and pray for you this morning. Uh, Rachel Becker sent out a prayer, emergency prayer chain uh, on the Facebook page. Pray for me. She's uh, 10 weeks along, and she was having some complications, and we prayed. And they went to the doctor, and they saw their little one, their little peanut, uh, alive and kicking and moving around. And so that's a praise. But we want to continue to pray for that pregnancy. Um, there's other people here I was talking to who, who went in this week and had surgery removed uh, skin cancer right right here. And so uh, praise the Lord, the cancer is gone. But you know, there are other people that, so let's just pray. Father God, we come to you this morning as uh, weak, feeble <laughs> people who need a father that cares. Father, we are so glad that we are your children, that you love us, that you care for us, that you are our protector, you are our provider, you are our great physician. And Father, we come to you this morning asking you to care for all of our needs, physical needs, our financial needs. Father, for our spiritual hurts, our relational hurts, we praise you, Father, for the good report for Rachel and the life that is in her. We pray, Father, that you would watch over her, that you would protect that life. Father, we pray for Walt, that you give him your peace. We pray for his doctors, that you guide their hands. We pray, Father, that his surgery would go, his procedure would go well, and that he would have healing. We thank you for his faithfulness to you, his love for you, and we thank you for his uh, love for this body and these people and for the word to be proclaimed in this church. Father, I come to you this morning tired, exhausted, lonely, uh, and I pray, Father, that you would use me. Father, this is your house, 
This is your time. These are your words. And we pray that we would listen to them, that we would receive them, that we would apply them, and that we might live for you and your glory. We pray, Father, for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? We are in Ecclesiastes, and we're going to finish out chapter 9. Here's what the preacher, the teacher, writes. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might. Through the poor man's, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war but one sinner destroys much good. Lord, may you bless these words in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we are going to be talking about our words this morning. My words, your words. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, has a whole little section in his letter on our words and the tongue, and we're going to be looking at that this morning. What we have here in this passage in Ecclesiastes 9, 13 through uh, 18 is a little bit of a parable, a wisdom story, if you will, and Jesus talked taught in stories, and this preacher teaches in stories. And so one of the things that we can see that a good teacher can and does do is use stories, um, because we can relate to stories. I have also seen this, verse 13, I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. Here's an example. When we here are the words. Here is a great example. That's the time that we want to lean in and pay attention. It's kind of like this is going to be on the test. Have you ever been in the classroom and the teacher says, this will be on the test? You get out your pen and paper and you go, I'm going to write this one down because it could come in handy later on in life. Well, this is one of those things. And here's the test. It's going to happen this week. You are going to need wisdom this week. I don't know if you knew that. The test could be right after church. You are going to need wisdom specifically with your words, unless you're mute, uh, which sometimes I think that would be a blessed curse. <laughs> there was a little city with a few men in it, is verse 14. And a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. Now this is an incredibly lopsided battle. According to all logic, there is no way that the little city with a few men in it has any chance whatsoever to withstand such power and authority. Now, I didn't necessarily know what a siege work was. I had an idea what a siege work was, but I uh, went online and Googled it. Gotta love Google. There's, uh, every great theologian knows how to use Google. I'm just saying that to make me feel better. <laughs> siege works were like scaffolding that that you would build against a, a, an enemy wall. You see, they, they built these walls as a form of defense. A city uh, that wasn't uh, defendable was basically prey to anybody. 
And here was a little city, and they were kind of minding their own business, if you will, and they built their little wall so they could live within their little town and mind their own business and not be annoyed by other people. And uh, this great king came across a little city, and he had more resources and finances probably than the whole kingdom put together times 10. And he built these siege works. He built these scaffoldings. And what these things did is they basically were their wall against your wall, and they rendered your defenses useless. In other words, this town they built their scaffolding so they can run their soldiers up and down it no problem and bring their weapons of warfare against you, and you had no defense. The, the siege works made your defense useless. Uh, I don't know how strong you've ever felt, but if you've ever had any strength or might, and somebody came along and just destroyed all your defenses just like that, you feel pretty powerless and pretty weak. And so there's no way that this city is going to be able to defend itself. But here is where we would do well to, to lean forward. You see, our world tells us that power and authority are essential. Our world tells us that if you want to be on the winning side, you get as much power and authority as possible. I have seen good, godly people who feel like they're on the losing side, join the winning side because nobody likes to be on a losing team, right? Now, here's the great thing about the Bible. I've read it in its entirety from cover to cover. I had to for Bible college. I had to for seminary, but I got to because I love the author. And there are so many times that the Christian life feels like it's a losing battle. We just feel like we're on the losing team. You know, broad is the path to destruction. Narrow is the way to eternal life. But, you know, there's times when we feel like we're on the losing side of the whole thing. There's times when we read in Scripture where great godly people are sawn in half when they're put in prisons, and it feels like there's no hope, there's no chance. Well, I, I just... I have a little bit of good news for you. I would encourage you to read the book cover to cover because the reality is while we feel like we're on the losing team in this world, if you get to the end of the book, I want you to know we're on the winning team. Amen. You've got to read the book. Don't wait for the movie. Read the book. <laughs> it's, it's far more glorious than we could ever imagine. When we're on the, I, I want you to know that, that Christ is going to come for his people. And we're going to be caught up with him in the blink of an eye. And we are going to be coming and he is going to be leading the charge on a white horse. And we're going to be with him. And we're going to be winners. We just got to get through this life. But there are people who are in this world that feel like, man, we're just, we're on the losing team. We're on the, the, the power and the authority out there is so much great. I'd rather be with them. And they go and they give up everything to be with power and authority. I have seen good men and women become impressed with power and authority and they make, up fool, they make foolish choices and they give up following God to be on the winning team. There is power in the great army. There is authority in the great king. And it seems like they have guaranteed victory. You know, but I want us to realize in God's economy, in God's kingdom, what doesn't seem to make sense makes sense. In other words, uh, God's teaching and God's ways do not reflect the world's thinking and the world's ways. In Ecclesiastes seven nineteen, we read this, wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than 10 rulers who are in the city. I want us to remember, we looked at that before, I want us to remember what that means. It means that wisdom doesn't necessarily go to the, the rulers and authority. The number one person, the, you know, the, whoever's the, the, the top of the chain of command doesn't necessarily mean that that person is wise. Would you agree with that in our world today? 
Wisdom is not always, does not always go to the strongest or the richest or the most powerful. So that means, and I shared this before, that the wisest person could be the janitor in a company. And so I want you to know that wisdom isn't reserved for number one. Reserve, wisdom is reserved for those who follow God, trust God, believe God, obey God, and live for God. A foolish conclusion is that the person in the high, with the highest authority has the greatest amount of wisdom. That's a foolish conclusion. Look at verse 15. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he by wisdom delivered the city. It wasn't the poor man's power that delivered the city. It wasn't the poor man's uh, money that delivered the city. And in fact, what we see, because this passage deals with our words, is that this wise person had wise words, and he used them. Wisdom simply means knowledge applied. That's what wisdom means, knowledge applied. Um, the word wisdom can also be translated as skill. Uh, I was thinking about this on my drive in this morning. Have you ever watched uh, like Olympic diving? And you see a diver do something and you go, oh wow, that was amazing. Did you see that? That was phenomenally twisted and turned, and, 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 he, and he landed, and it was amazing. And then you hear the announcers, well, if you notice, his feet were a little wide, his foot was out, his nose was up, and I was like, if I'm a judge, I'm going to go over and shake that person's hand and just go, wow, here's a medal. That was phenomenal. You see, what they learned and what they did is they had skill and precision and, and the more skill and the more precision and the more discipline and the more they do it, the more complex that they can do these things and they can twist and they can turn and they can flip and they can enter the water and just make a little drop go up in the air. And to the untrained eye, it looks absolutely phenomenal. But to those who are skillful in what they do, they can pick it apart and they can say what they did wrong. I'm not in that place to do that. Well, that's kind of like wisdom. Wisdom is skillful living. It's, it's applying. It's knowing. It's, it's, it's making something really complex and really hard look really easy. And skillful living and wise living is taking the Word of God that's very hard and very complex and applying it and living it in such a way that everyone else goes, wow, that, that's like insane. I've never seen anyone do that. I've never seen anyone respond that way, and it's because we, we live it, we breathe it, we apply it, we know it, we take the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit within us takes the Word of God and makes it make sense to us, and it's heavy on our heart, and it's part of our mind, and it's the way we see, and it's the way we think, and, and so for us, it's natural, it's normal, and for anyone else going, that's different, that's weird, that's complex, that's amazing, how did they know to say that, when to say, you see, wisdom is knowing what to say, when to say, where to say, how to say how to live, how to respond in, 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 in the most stressful, strainful situations. It's, it's someone coming to you with a doctor saying, you have cancer, and you're going, I'm, praise God. That doesn't make any sense. How does he do that? Well, he's been walking with God, living with God, uh, or she's been walking with God, living with God, so that when they get this news, it doesn't destroy them. They, can, they have wisdom because they've been taking godly things and applying them. That's wisdom. Well, here is a man, there was man, a poor, wise man. It's nonsensical in our world today because we think that somehow wisdom equals wealth. That does, that's not necessarily so. Wisdom doesn't make sense to our world. Here was a man who knew what to say, when to say, how to say it. He was a nobody, not trying to be anything other than faithful to the Lord. 
And when they were besieged, this poor wise man, by the way he lived, by the way he spoke, by the way he conducted himself and all of these things, he was able to deliver the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. Here's the thing with life. Here's the problem with life is we all have short-term memory loss. It's not just that the poor man's name is forgotten and no one remembers who he is. It's that his wisdom was forgotten. The character of the poor man was forgotten. The life of the poor man was forgotten. And what does this mean? It means later on, that city was defenseless. I want to share with you some wisdom that seems to be forgotten today. There's, there's been wise people that have lived, and, and there's been wisdom that has preserved things. And, and, and I just want to share with you a piece of wisdom that I, I think that is lacking in our culture, in our world. Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's, that's wisdom here. And I, and I kind of think that in the context of this, this is what happened because we deal with words. So I, I, I think that the wise man in the city, uh, the, the, the poor man that was living in this small little place that was besieged, I think, I think he expressed this kind of wisdom. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Let me give you some stories in Scripture that reflect this. Uh, I've shared with you that uh, in the book of Judges, there's this character named Gideon, and he is a bit of a coward, but he's a wise coward. How do I know that? Well, in Judges chapter 8, verse 1, we have a situation in a conversation that happens between a tribe and Gideon, and it says, the men of Ephraim said to Gideon, this is Judges 8, 1, it says, the men of Ephraim said to Gideon, what is this that you have done to us not to call us when you went to fight against Midian? So, uh, and they accused him fiercely. So here's a tribe coming against Gideon, and they're fiercely accusing him, and I think Gideon offers us an expression of a soft answer turns away wrath. It says, and Gideon said to them, what have I done in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of grapes of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abizar? God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? It says, then their anger against him subsided when he said this. What, what was happening? These people came to, to Gideon and said, what are you doing going to war and, and not bringing us? And he's saying, look, what I did pales in comparison to what you've done. You've taken care of princes and, and leaders. I just took out a few soldiers. You are far greater than I am. And they were like, oh, okay. Well, at least you know where you're, you're at. Okay. A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Here's another story in Scripture that had the exact opposite of this. You see, David was fleeing for his life, and he had this ragtag group of kind of rebels, and they were all uh, kind of the who's who's of America's most wanted, if you will. They were kind of a, a vicious ragtag group of people, but they were following David. Their hearts had been changed. David's fleeing from his life from Saul, and he was hungry. And so he said, uh, hey, send some guys up to Nabal. Now, Nabal had uh, some sheep in a field, and David was a shepherd at heart, and he was protecting Nabal's sheep. And so David was hungry, and he said, hey, we've been protecting Nabal's sheep. Go send some men up and ask Nabal for some food. And in 1 Samuel chapter five or 25, verse 10, it says, and Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? And how many servants these days are breaking away from their masters? Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men who come from I don't know where? So they took that message back to David. Now they gave a harsh answer to David's men. So this is David's response. Remember, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer turns up ang stirs up anger. So they gave David's men some harsh words. So they took those harsh words and they took it to David. So David's young men turned away and came back and told David everything he said. And David said to his men, 
every man strap on his sword. And every man strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained back. Uh, Nabal gave a harsh answer. And Nabal stirred up anger in the wrong person. Uh, Fortunately for Nabal, he fell over and broke his neck and died before David got there. Uh, But Nabal's wife heard about it, and she took care of the story. Verse 16, but I say that wisdom is better than might. Through the poor man's, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. You know, it is wrong for us to assume that a person who is poor is unwise. Um, but wisdom is better than might. Wisdom is better than might. We live in America where bigger is better. If we were in Dallas, Texas, I'd be preaching a whole different aspect of bigger is better. Because they like Texas sometimes is all about big and better. Wisdom is better than might. You know, our God dwells in a high and holy place and with the lowly in spirit. Isn't that amazing? Our God dwells in a high and holy place and with the lowly in spirit. There are three things that are dangerous. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Those three things are very, very dangerous in the Christian walk. There is great wisdom in humility. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with our God. You want to be something? You want to be great? You want to be number one? Jesus was with his disciples. And his disciples were real men like you and me. And they had a couple brothers in there. They're, they were the sons of thunder. Their dad was apparently a hot-headed man, and they were a lot like their dad. And they were successful businessmen. They wanted to be great. They wanted to be leaders. They wanted to be the best. And they had a mom that was their biggest cheerleader. And she went to Jesus and said, hey, do me a favor. You know, you got two great disciples with you, two phenomenal disciples. Two, I mean, they're the best of all that you got. Of all the ones that you chose, my two boys are the better than all of them. And you would do well to put my two boys as number one and number two. And the disciples heard about this, and they were talking. And Jesus knew what they were grumbling about. And he said, what what are you guys talking about? So he brought them all together. And he said, look, you hear how the rulers and the authorities lord their authority over everyone else. Not so with you. If you want to be great in my kingdom, then you've got to be the least. You've got to be a servant. You know, godly leadership, godly wisdom doesn't look like number one trying to be number one. Godly wisdom, godly leadership looks like Jesus did when he took a towel and wrapped it around his waist and he said, I'm showing you what leadership looks like. And he got down and he washed his disciples' feet. You see, that's what it is to be wise in God's eyes. It's not to be the most powerful, it's to be a servant of people. It's to put other people's needs over your own needs. It's to humble yourself and to consider more, other people as more important than you. That's what godly wisdom looks like. That's what godly leadership looks like, is putting other people's needs over your own needs. That's why wisdom is better than might, because you're trusting God and you're, you're becoming like God. Back in Ecclesiastes 9.11, if you just look back a few verses, we see this. Again, I saw that under the sun the race 
is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance will happen to them all. Life, the world doesn't necessarily look like how it should be, and God's ways doesn't look like how it should be. It's not an irony to be poor and wise. To forget the poor man's wisdom is to reject the poor man altogether, everything about him, his example, his teaching, his life, and all that he stood for. Let's not forget the the poor wise man. You know, in our world today, there are people who feel like that little city. There are people who feel like that the enemy has surrounded them and they're much stronger than them and they're much more powerful than them and they, they feel pretty hopeless and they feel pretty trapped and they feel pretty confined and what they need is wisdom. There are some people in life who have lived this life on their own terms and they've built up certain walls in certain ways that they think that they're safe in their own little confines and the enemy has surrounded them. I want you all to know that this is a little bit of a parable and a little bit of a story in in a way that we can all relate to because we all try to live in such a way where we try to make it look like we have it all put together. Do you know anyone like that? where we feel like we have it all put together, and then all of a sudden the enemy kind of lays siege to us, and we feel trapped, and we all need wisdom. I just want to let you know that the ultimate wisdom in life is this. Lord, I surrender. I give my life to you. Let God fight your battles. Let God take you through it. The ultimate wisdom in life is saying, Lord, I surrender to you, and I need you to handle my enemies. I need you to do it. That's the ultimate expression of wisdom in our world today is to to just let God fight our battles for us. The gospel is foolishness to the world. You know, um, I remember when I was trying to to make me look good. I was a liar. I, I lied obsessively. And I would wake up in the morning, I remember this, saying, Lord, uh, I would tell, I, don't, I wasn't even a Christian, but I was talking to God. Like, God, I'm not going to lie today. Like, I, I could just feel all my lies were mounting against me, and they were about to fall on me. And I knew that if I kept going, I wasn't going to have a single friend in the world. And so I would say, Lord, I'm not going to lie today. So I'd wake up. I'd, I mean, I remember one day the sun was shining my, my, out, out the front of my out of the front of the porch of my grandma's house was this beautiful view of Mount Hood. And I just remember seeing the snow white mountain and the blue skies and it was like springtime. And I was like, this is a great day to start all over. I'm not going to lie today. This is, this is me before Christ. I'm not going to lie today. And I got out of my bed and I looked out, this is a great day. And I, and I, and I hadn't talked to anybody all day. So I hadn't lied yet. So I go all the way down. Now, our driveway was about uh, a little over a tenth of a mile down to the end where the bus stop was. So I made it all the way down there, had my backpack on. I got off the bus. I sat in a chair where I sat in a seat where no one was next to me. So far, so good. So we're riding to school. Now, I knew that if we stopped at Tony Hornback stop, he was going to talk to me. So I put my backpack next to me so Tony wouldn't sit next to me because I had been lying to Tony the whole next day, the whole day before. And Tony was telling everybody my lies. So you know, part of, I mean, that's just, I don't know why we do this, but I know that I'm lying to him and I know he's telling everybody my lies and I know they're going to come back to me. So if I can just keep Tony from sitting next to me. Well, that didn't work. Tony sits down next to me. Hey, did you? I'd be like, uh, so I went along with my lies. I couldn't stop lying. I was a slave to lying. I was trapped by lying. I couldn't stop lying. And I knew that if, I mean, my, my lies were mounting up against me. I knew that the only way that I could ever be healed from this was to stop lying. And there was nothing inside of me that could stop lying. But when I gave my life to Christ, I gave my life to Christ on a Wednesday By the way, that same day I gave my life to Christ, earlier the day before, I broke Tony Hornback's nose. (laughs) 
for telling people about my lies. So I was suspended from school the day I went to youth group <laughs> and accepted Christ. I knew I was a bad kid. Thursday at school, I didn't know what happened when I gave my life to Jesus, but I knew that I needed forgiveness, and I knew that I needed grace, and I knew that I needed the gospel. So I gave my life to Christ Wednesday night. Thursday, and Wednesday night, my, they were my foster parents at the time, but Joanne Opp goes, stop. Oh, she was so excited I gave my life to Christ. This means you're, in, you're born again. I didn't know what that meant. I just thought you're weird. I just said a prayer. I asked Jesus to forgive me. So the next day at school Thursday, Tracy came up to me, and she said, Tony Hornback told me that you said this. Is it true? This is, I don't know where this came from. Yep, that's true. She was just as surprised as I was. Where did that come from? How did I tell the truth? Something supernatural had happened inside of me. When I gave my life to Christ, I was able to be honest about my lies. And Tracy said, well, don't do that again. And I said, I'll do my best not to. And, and we kind of walked away, and I thought, wow. Now, I was working at a place called Scenic Fruit Company, uh, a little bit later, and I was, um, my job at night was to wash all the berries from all the machines down the floor, squeegee it into a big pile, and then put it into a drum that got turned into gummy bears later. So don't eat gummy bears, because it's made out of droppings that I, that's a true story. They cooked it at a high heat. But I was dragging the fire hose, and do you know the little metal things that are on the floor that you scrape your feet on, and, and it wipes the dirt off your foot, boot? Well, I was dragging the fire hose, and it caught the corner of that, and it ripped a big hole right in the side, and I thought, I'm going to get fired. So I got to go to the boss, because I need a new fire hose to do my job, and the whole time that I'm walking there, I'm thinking through all the lies that I could tell in my head. And I open the door, and I say, I was dragging the fire hose, and it caught one of those little boot things, and I ripped a big hole in it. And he said, hey, no problem. I got another hose. It's right over here. We'll get it for you. That's happened before. And I thought, how did I tell the truth? And, wow, that was way easier than I ever imagined. <laughs> like, telling the truth was just a, a way of relief. Now, I want you to know that the enemy had laid so many sieges on me, and I want you to know that wisdom is following God and doing it God's way. That's all wisdom is. It's following God and doing it God's way. And honesty and truth is an aspect of wisdom. Just like not stealing, not committing adultery, obeying God is an act of wisdom. Wisdom is skillful living. Skillful living is simply taking God's word and applying it. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So at the source of wisdom isn't me. It's really worship. It's really me just obeying God and living for him. That's what wisdom is. The gospel is foolishness. Wisdom doesn't look like the world around us. Wisdom looks like the nature and the character of God and, and living for him. Look at verse 17. The words of the wise heard in quiet is better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Here is the thing about God's wisdom. You can just simply rest on it. You don't need to yell. You don't need to shout. You just need to do. There needs to be a peace that passes all understanding and arresting and trusting in God's ways as opposed to my ways. Somehow, we live in a world that doesn't just think that the highest authority or the strongest might, but somehow the loudest voice is the winner. And so we have people that just start to shout and start to scream and start to make their face turn purple because they're right and everybody else is wrong. That's foolishness. They let emotion get the best of them. You do not need to yell to make a point. 
here's the thing. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, this is one of the greatest verses on lifestyle evangelism. This is one of the greatest verses about living and reflecting the nature and character of Christ, about, about exuding God's will, following God's, wis- God's will, which is wisdom. It says this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Hopefully you have it highlighted. If you don't, this is a good one to highlight. Hopefully you have it memorized. If you don't, this is a good scripture memory verse. It says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. What does that mean? In our hearts. The heart is the center of all of my motives. In my heart, I long for holiness because God is holy. I set the Lord Christ, I honor the Lord Christ as holy, and I desire that, I desire his holiness in my life. And I live it. And then it says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. In other words, you simply live this life. You, you're honest, you're hardworking, you honor your mother, you honor your father, you don't steal, you're not screaming and yelling, you don't let the emotions get the best of you. You, you, you work hard, you live within your means, you're content and you have hope and joy in God, and the world is out there making a mess out of their life and they look at you and go, what do you have that I don't have? Like, my life looks like a big train wreck right now, and you're living in a single wide trailer, and you're happy and content. What do you have that I don't have in my big house with all my cars and my pretty wife, my third, fourth wife, that I've been trying to figure this whole thing out? What do you have that I don't have? Well, you've been setting setting apart Christ as Lord, and you've been honoring him. You've been trying to live for him and reflect his nature and his character because you actually love him and you want to live for him, and and, and, and you see your life as an act of worship to him. Then it says this, yet do this with gentleness and respect. So when you're living this way and this person comes up to you, you don't get this red face and you don't just like, oh, you're wrong and you did this and you voted for that person and your politics are all messed up. And you're... No, you don't do that. <laughs> you do this with gentleness and respect. Why? Because you don't need to yell. You see, leadership, godly leadership that rests and trusts in God is a non-anxious, influencing presence. You see, when your hope and life is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ, and the storms come and the trials come, and your house stands because you're built on the rock of Jesus Christ, you can have a non-anxious influencing presence. And you can be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is within you. And your life exudes something that is different. You don't need to scream and yell to make a point. You just need to live it. And it starts by surrendering your life to God. And God, through that response of saying, Lord, I give it to you, his Holy Spirit. When you, when you give your life to Christ, God gives you his Holy Spirit to dwell within you. That gives you the ability, the supernatural ability. Let me tell you something. Living for God on your own effort doesn't work. It takes the Holy Spirit in you because God's ways are supernatural. So when you reflect the nature and the character of God, it takes something supernatural. You can't do it on your own. Christianity is not do more, try harder, be better. It's live and love, live for God and love God with everything that you are. And when you do that, you do it. Does that make sense? Titus, uh, here's some other passages. Titus 3, 1. Remind the church to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and show perfect courtesy towards all people. Uh, Does Battleground need that right now? Uh, if, if Battleground doesn't need it, your wife or your husband does, and your kids do. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. This is how it concludes here. 
Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. L- let, let, me just, let me just say this. This whole thing, sometimes it feels like a house of cards. <laughs> and it only takes one moment of living on your own strength and your own logic and your own might to lose your cool and to make the whole thing fall apart. In other words, wisdom trusts God from beginning to end. Skillful, the skillful person, the diver that does everything right and then does a belly flop at the end, that kind of ruins the whole thing, right? You, 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 gotta, you gotta trust God at the end as much as at the beginning because it just takes a moment of you to ruin it, doesn't it? Uh, I'm speaking from experience on this one, people. (laughs) Here's a few other passages. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think of these things. I mean, if if you feel yourself start to lose it, here's a tool. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Because I want us to know that you in your sin and me and my sin, we're ugly. And we can bring about a a situation to make it ugly real fast. But when we bring Christ into the situation, uh, we, we can disarm something that's very, very threatening. I hope you're able to track with me this morning. Like I said, I didn't sleep very good last night. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. That's a preservative, okay? So let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may, that you, sorry, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let me say that again. Let your speech always be gracious. You know why? People remember gracious words. That's, if, if you've lost it and somebody has kept their cool and they were gracious and, and it calmed you down, you walk away, you remember the gracious words of that person. But those gracious words are preserving. They're actually even endearing. Uh, Ephesians 4.29. I shared this with the, the kids uh, out at the the house and they're doing the construction project. As a youth pastor, this was also one of my favorite verses. I memorized it in the NIV. I'm preaching from the ESV. If you look at my life, you can follow my spiritual life by my translations. The ones I memorized in the Living Bible, that was my very first Bible. Then I got an NIV Bible. I memorized that. In Montana, I had an NAS Bible. And in Pullman, I got an ESV, and I've kept the ESV. So you can track my spiritual heritage by which translation I memorize it in. Here's what it says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except for what is beneficial for building up other people according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. Do not let any unwholesome talk. But I'm right. I'm telling the truth. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except for what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. But I'm right. I've got something. You know what? Do not let any unwholesome talk. Well, I'm telling the truth. Do not let any unwholesome talk. How can truth be unwholesome? Is it beneficial? Does it build up? If it's not beneficial and it doesn't build up, it could be truth. Keep your words to yourself. My, my grandma, a non-believer, would tell me this. Sean, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. It's kind of right there. I thought that was a proverb. I've been waiting my whole Christian life to read that in the Bible, but you know what? The principles are there. That's the conclusion. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Let your words be gracious. Build others up. 
You know what? When you do that, your words can disarm a hostile situation in your marriage, with your children, with your neighbors, with your coworkers. Why is it so important? Because God tells us to let our light shine. And when we have words that are seasoned with salt, filled with grace, people want to come up to us and say, tell me what you have that I don't have. When we explode and we're yelling and we're screaming, I don't want what you have. I got that at home. I got that at work. I got that at my family reunion. I get that Christmas, Easter. What? You know what? We as Christians should live our lives in such a way that when someone who's a non-believer comes in here, they should go, what do they have that I don't have? I, I want what they have. That was me. When I, when I got to know Christians, and trust me, I was interviewing them, whether they knew it or not. I wanted to know, are you real? Is, is that truly who you were? And when I saw that it was, I said, that's what I want. That's what I want, because they had something that I had never seen before. And I tell you what, when I do this right, when I trust God and I live according to his will and his way, I have peace like I've never had before. You know, we're going to sing a song here in just a minute. Well, before we do that, we're going to have a testimony because Bob's going to baptize his brother. And so um, Bob was a light and a witness. So where, where is Bob Rivers? Okay. Uh, I probably should have explained that more to him before they did that. <laughs> well, just so you know, I've heard Mark's testimony. Mark is Bob's brother. Mark shared with me on the phone. Uh, Mark called me up and said, you don't know me, but Bob's my brother. And Bob has been witnessing to me. And he has been reading his Bible to me. And he has been sharing the gospel with me. And I gave my life to the Lord because of Bob. And I want Bob to baptize me. Amen. Great. We're Baptist, <laughs> and we have a baptismal, and we'll do that. Um, but, but let me just share, Bob's faithfulness and his wise living was done in such a way that Mark said, I want what you have. And now Bob, in a few minutes, is going to baptize his brother. And so, uh, you, you, do you have your testimony written? Okay. Uh, all right, come on in front of the microphone, and Mark will let you read it. And I'm going to have Bob's wife come on up here with the camera because she wants, she wants to video this. This is family. This is, this is good stuff. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're good. You're good. So go ahead and read your testimony. Uh, or, three and a half years ago, I, um, I reconnected with my brother, Hadn't seen him for 23 years, and uh, I gave him a Bible because he didn't know God. I gave him a Bible and a, a book by Adrian Rogers and a daily devotional. And three and a half years later, I can tell you this is a man of God. He reads the Bible, he believes it, and he's ready to commit to Christ. When Bob gave me the Bible and the book by Adrian Rogers, I began my walk with Christ. I have been blessed by getting to know and understand God's word and the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. I'm willing to turn from sin and now ask Jesus to come into my heart and life as my personal savior. Amen. All right, Mark, I have two questions. And you just, uh, just got to answer, yes, you've already proclaimed, but have you by faith accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And will you, to the best of your ability, live for his glory the rest of your life? Yes, sir. All right, Bob. Thank you. Hey, Bob. My brother. There you go. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. 